Thanks, Nick. Okay, so imagine this. You know some agile stuff. You know about Scrum. You know about the, the developer role. You've been a developer, as Nick said. You've been a Scrum master. You've been a product owner. You understand, or, or you buy into the concept of cross-functional teams. You understand the importance of teams in an agile context. You get it. People should be cross-functional, teams should be cross-functional. Uh, the, the team is the thing which delivers the work and the increment. But there's one problem. You feel like an imposter. You feel like a fraud. You feel like a pretender. If people ask you, how do you do it? What is it? How do you make a cross-functional team? How do you make a team deliver? Your answers are kind of things like, well, the team's cross-functional. Or the team should be delivering stuff. You don't actually have an answer. And that's how I felt, an imposter. So what do you do? What did, I, what did I do? I started reading some stuff. Five Dysfunctions of a Team, really good book. One of many books that I've read, um, and I'm sure many people have, have read this book. I started trying some stuff, trying out some things, experimenting. One of the things that came through in Jake's presentation yesterday morning was about trying stuff and failing and learning. Getting some feedback. So you're asking people, how did I do? What can I improve on? How can I get better? That's what I did. And then what if, when you're doing that, you work out that the secret source, the secret of, of putting teams together isn't so secret after all. Uncommon sense is the term that I use. Or if you're a child of, of the 70s, the bleeding obvious, to use a term borrowed from Basil Fawlty. You realize all of this stuff, that it's not actually that hard, that there is a way of, of pulling your teams together so they are responsive. Hence the title, the not so secret source to make your teams responsive. So why is, why is this a thing? Why am I here? I guess there's a question I'm, I'm asking myself right now. Um, if you think about the, our work, work currently in, in our everyday jobs is, is a really a team sport. Everything we do is in teams from scrum teams, obviously. We're at an Agile New Zealand conference. There's a lot of talk about, about scrum. Uh, sorry. Project teams. Scrum teams being cross-functional, self-organized. Project teams being cross-functional, normally not so self-organizing. Often you'll need somebody to help you organize. I love the um, positivity in here, from the, in the Gantt chart, by the way. Go live on that date. We've all been there, I think. Test teams, or any team which is distributed across other teams, everything we're doing is in teams, from leadership teams to executive teams, and I kind of see executive teams as the same as any other team, just a little bit shinier. Wearing smarter clothing, I guess, would be a way of, of thinking about those. So work <clears throat> being a team sport, that's why it's important to make your teams responsive, because the general expectation, and I've tested this, every time I... I ask why we're in teams, this is the answer that comes out. The output of our teams should be greater than the sum of all the parts. This comes up time and time again. But the problem I see is we don't do anything to, to foster that in our teams. We don't do anything to cultivate teamwork. Often we just say to people, you're a team, and leave them to it to deliver the work. Whereas there's an expectation that that's just going to um, achieve a greater output than the sum of those parts. So in my view, we've got to foster it. We've got to do something about it. So that's why I'm talking about teams. That's why teams are important. And then the other part that I wanted to talk about was making them responsive. Why do we want to make them responsive? Well, we put people in teams with a view that they'll be able to react quickly. We want them to react quickly. We want them to react positively. And yet we still don't do anything, or we do very little to cultivate that in a team. And really, we're talking about culture underneath it all. What is the culture of the team? And we don't just leave them to it, in my view. We, we need to, to work on it with them. So what do we get as an organization? Why might we want our teams to be responsive? We get greater productivity if they're responsive. We get to deliver productive units of work out to the public quicker. More innovation, if they've got the right attitude. Better innovation and being able to react to the, the technological pace of change. Really important when we look at, at um, what's going on in the technology world. And I heard the singularity talked about yesterday. All of that stuff becomes really important um, 
when you consider that we should be making our teams responsive. So this is really what I'm trying to answer. How do we do it? A lot of really good talk over the, over the last day and a half around teams. I tend to uh, sit on the edges of, of these sessions and um, just try and soak up the kinds of things that people are talking about. A lot of talk about teams and psychological safety yesterday. And, and that comes back again today in terms of how you do it. First step, how do you make your team a team? You've got to decide they want to be a team. You've got to, you've got to choose that you want to be a team, as opposed to a, a working group, I guess. And there's, there's nothing wrong with being a working group. The difference, a quick difference, a team is a working group who has a purpose, and they work together to achieve that purpose. A working group is, is a bunch of individuals who work together um, to achieve some tasks. And there's nothing wrong. It's OK. I work with a group um, in Wellington recently where we got together, we, there, was, there was three teams I was dealing with in the organization, and one, one of the teams, we got together and we said, actually, we're just a working group. We just need to deliver the, this thing at the end. And these people have their bit to do over here, these people have their bit to do here, and these people have their bit to do here. And that's fine. Not a problem at all. But if you, if you want to be a team, if you want to get the benefit of the output being greater than the sum of all the parts, then you need to foster that. But the first step is deciding that that's what you want to do. Identifying who's in and who's out, you should be able to point at your team members. Point at the people in a team and go, you're, in, you're part of this team. And I can't, um, I can't understate the number of times I go into organizations as a consultant and people don't know whether they're in a team or out of a team. Well, I kind of was on this team last week, but then they kind of did this and this person said that and I don't really know what's going on anymore. You've got to make it clear who's in the team and who's out. And even... Even worse, when you're 50% in one team and 50% in another, or what I see often is 50% in one project, 50% in another project, and 25% in another project. The maths aren't wrong. Somehow you're supposed to, to manage that stuff. So put people in a team. Choose that you want to be a team, put them in, and um, then have a um, stable membership. So what did I do? What, are, what have I done? I was, we, were, we were a group of agilists at my, my previous organization, this is all I did. Hey guys, I'd like us to be a team. I wanted to try out some team building stuff. You up for it? You want to do it? Just because I didn't know how to do it. I felt like a fraud and imposter. What do you think the response was? <laughs> all you people that said no, you can leave now. Just open the door, Lorna. Um, OK, generally people are responsive. Because we all understand that the output of a team should be greater than the sum of all the parts. So we did it. We tried some stuff. This is, this is us trying some stuff. Um, so the, the first step, the next step in, in putting it together, once you've chosen you want to be a team, is give them a purpose. Understand your purpose. Sometimes it comes from management. Sometimes it comes from within a team. It gives a focus to everything that you do. It answers the, the key question, why are we here? I don't mean in some existentialist kind of way, why are we on earth, why, why do we exist? It's why am I in this team? Why does this team exist? It gives a, a, um, a reason for being, as opposed to a goal. A goal, to me, states a desire to, to, to achieve something. This is deeper than that. The reason for being. So if you're in a team, what can you do? Understand the purpose of that team. Why does that team exist? Why is it important that they do well? What does the organization get out of, out of this team? Why does this organization want this team to exist? And make sure that everyone gets it. And in running this presentation through with my son, he's asked me, why is this guy so angry? He's just thinking. That's my thinking face. Watch out for that if anyone asks a tough question later on. I did this with teams. I've done this with a couple of teams recently and um, a team I'm working with at a client, and this is what they came back. To help the business deliver high quality, full stack solutions, sometimes technical, sometimes just process. And to me that was really good. A couple of things stand out. Full stack, front end, UI, middleware, and the legacy application. And this is an organization who has had real problems with legacy applications and the fact they've got a team just to deal with that. So to hear the team understand that that's their purpose was really, really good for me. And the other bit 
it drove a conversation around sometimes the solutions that we're trying to deliver are technical. Sometimes when they talk to us, we'll, we'll go back with a, a solution which is just a process change. That's really good observation, but driving that conversation gives the team a purpose. Um, and then the Agile team I talked about in um, a previous employer, this is what we came up with. This is what we started with. This was my idea. It comes from the All Blacks, wanting to be the best team in the history of the world. That's not where we ended up. We did pull it back a little bit, and it became about uh, we deliver, we help our clients deliver the right stuff. So really, really straightforward. But having a purpose becomes really important. So when I set up a team for a purpose, this is what I try. These six questions that come from Patrick Lencioni's The Advantage. I have a session, one hour, hour and a half probably, just to talk in the team about these things. Why do we exist? Why are we here? What do we do? How must we behave? How will we succeed? Who must do what? What is most important to do right now? And so you can kind of see it's not just about purpose, because what you get is all kinds of questions, all kinds of answers flying at you. Some, some people will start talking about the work they actually do. Great. Throw it in the what do we do section. Really good question number four. That, that doesn't get asked often enough. How will we succeed? How do we know that we've succeeded? I often, I tend to, question number three, I leave that. How must we behave? Because I'll come back to that very soon. Um, but it's not important to understand right now. But where are we going? Who's going to do what? What's, what do we need to do right now? Really good way to start a team, a kickoff session for a team. Here's an example. I'm not expecting you to read all of this. Here's an example um, recently that I did with a team. You, know, you can see why do we exist to help the business deliver high quality, full stack solutions, sometimes technical, sometimes just process. That's fine. Um, they listed out the work, really revealing to get different views on different types of work. Testers always have really good input in here because what they do often gets left till last. BAs as well. But what, what I think was really good was this conversation. How will we succeed? We'll deliver solutions that meet the business need. That was where it started. Deliver solutions that meet the business need. OK, that's great. How will they know? Well, uh, how, do, how will you know they, they meet the business need? Oh, well, Joe, we'll have to measure it. OK, well, is, how are you going to measure it? Well, we'll measure it. Ex if, did we deliver something? Well, no, 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 no. Based on how they measure success. So it's not about you. It's about how they measure success, um, providing clarity and transparency. So you've got to take them on the journey as well. So really good conversations for a team to understand why they're there, understand why they exist. And it's just a one, one and a half hour session on a whiteboard, answering these six questions. It drives a really good conversation. So once, you've got perp once you choose to be a team, once you've got some purpose, you understand why you're there, then you need to set in place some agreements some understanding of what's acceptable, what's expected, what's not expected, um, and um, what kind of behaviours you should be seeing amongst a team to understand that you're a team, to make sure you're a team. And there's a bunch of things that a team needs to agree about, and it's amazing the number of organisations, again, I go into where the roles and responsibilities aren't clear, where somebody, two things happen. Either the roles and responsibilities aren't clear and somebody fills that gap or that gap remains unfulfilled and the project misses out or the work misses out. So these are the things. What are the appropriate behaviours? And in, in the Agile world, definition of done, definition of ready, standard stuff, even your release process. If you don't understand what, what that is, then, then get an agreement on what it is. Whatever you need to agree on, you need to put those agreements in place. How do you want to act? How do you want to behave? So what do I try? This agile team, here's what we did. We wanted to have a charter. We wanted to have an expectation of, of how we were supposed to act. And charters, I think, get a bad rap because we don't give them meaning to ourselves. We don't give them legs. So what we wanted to do was to make it a bit more meaningful to us. So we did a session. In the, one week, we did a charter session. It came up with things like, uh, we'll turn up to meetings on time. We'll give you feedback when you need it. And it was the standard stuff. And that's where I think charters um, run into trouble. We needed to, to drill a little bit deeper. Yeah, for those of you who are more observant, I, I was having a sweary day with the, with the whiteboard marker. Um, so what do we do? 
we came up with some concepts, like we will stab each other in the front, not the back. That's our way of saying we will give you honest feedback. And boy, did they stab me in the front sometimes. But it gave us permission to be able to do that. Some other things, some really good things that come in. Whoops. Carry each other's bags. We'll carry each other's bags when required. And the concept comes from five-day ultramarathon running, where you're running as a team. And at some point over those five days, every one of those team members is going to hit the wall. But they rely on the, the other team members to get them through it. And we talked about it. And then we had a really good conversation saying, well, yeah, but uh, where am I? But you need to allow other people to carry your bags as well. So carry each other's bags when required, and we'll allow others to carry our bags. So it tells us if we're struggling, we'll put a hand up and go, yep, I need help here. Some really good stuff started coming out. Um, be courageous, but not stupid. In our roles, we have courageous conversations with clients. But we're not going to march into the CEO's office and, and effing and blinding and, and calling him an idiot because of what's going on in the organization. We're going to be courageous, have a courageous conversation, but we're not going to be stupid about it. But underneath it all, there are two really important things to me. Um, it's not about perfection. We're, still, we're acknowledging that we're not perfect, that we're just trying to do some stuff. And above all, go on and do your thing. You know, we trust each other to be able to go and do our thing, do our job. And we're out on client site, and we're playing what's in front of us. There were some really important things that came out in this charter session. Giving it more weight, making it meaningful to us was really important. And then for management, what do you do? Management, again, shinier than, than um, teams, um, smarter clothing. You've got to live it. Put together a charter as well. You should have your own charter if you're in a leadership team, a management team, an executive team. But the most important thing for you guys is to make sure you live it. The moment that you let those who, who report to you, you let them down by not living your charter. As soon as you step outside of the charter. And charters are great when things are going well. Really good when things are going well. But the test of the charter is when things aren't going well. Going through an organization at the moment who have a release process mapped out, change acceptance board or change control board, whatever you want to call them, and they're running into trouble in the project. The project's due live in the next month or so. And what we're seeing is this, this change process is being eroded because the pressure's on. That's the time when you need to uphold these things. So we've chosen to be a team. We've given them a purpose. Um, we've got some agreements in, in place. Now we need to, to get some understanding of each other. We need to understand what makes each other tick and what value we bring to the team. And some concepts here, um, we need to understand how all the parts work together in a team. And the, the hardest bit for me to understand, no one person is more important than a team. I'm like, what? <laughs> um, but ensure that the, everyone's voice has, gets heard. So appreciate the individual is the concept. We all have a part to play in making this team work. And in talking my presentation through with my 14-year-old son um, over the weekend, he's looking at this going, yeah, Dad, because even in this, the small cog's still turning. The small cog's doing, doing some work in there. Yes, he is, son. And using my limited knowledge of engineering, I'm able to say, actually, son, that small cog is moving like buggery to keep up with the big cog. And the other way it works is that small cog is probably turning the other way from the big cog. That's how teams work. So you understand the concept. What is, what is the role of everybody in the team? How do you facilitate everyone having a voice? And as management, your role, if you're outside of the team, is to make sure that everybody sees the picture. I can see a guy at the back going like this and going like that, it's making sure the cogs are working in different ways. I've had it explained to me. It, apparently, it does work like that. I've got a music degree, not an engineering degree, so I'm no help. Um, but as management, you've got to see the big picture. You've got to make sure that the team can see the big picture, and everybody understands the important role that everybody plays in delivering the output for a team. Uh, a story I heard recently about NASA, um, this is going back uh, through the, the 60s, where the, the guy who swept the floors in the factory and made sure that no dust got um, into the spaceships, because obviously it was a problem. Friction is a problem. Again, I've, I've pretty much exhausted my science knowledge. Uh, friction is a problem. 
Um, but his, he saw his role, once they looked at it all, his, he saw his role as, I help put spaceships into space. It's a key part, it's a really small part. It was perceived as a small part. Another, another story, I, I remember walking through LAX, um, and or, actually it was Seattle Airport, and they've got these guys with um, cleaners. They've got, a, they've got a stick, and they've got a rag on the stick where they're just cleaning off shoe marks from the floor. And we walked past, and I said to him, sorry, I was just walking past where he was cleaning. He said, no, that's all right, sir. If you didn't walk past, I wouldn't have a job. And it's that kind of thing where you're seeing yourself as, as, a, as a, a part of a bigger system. It becomes really important with a team. So appreciating the individual um, and understanding that we're all different. Some people think of them in big ideas. Some people like to think methodically in, in checkboxes, ticking things off. It's important if you're part of a team to get all of those voices. Don't let the dominant people dominate. Um, we did, so what did we do? We did this um, disk profiles. Very common. A lot of organizations using disk profiles. And we looked at those and said, OK, well, I'm a DC. That's my dot there, actually. That's my dot. What does that mean? It's a bit like the charter. You've got to make it meaningful. What does it mean to us? What does it mean for my role in the team? So we looked at what makes, um, we, did a, a, we looked at our disk profiles, and we, we looked at which parts of a D are me, which parts of a C are me, and which parts aren't. And we came up with some things here. This, whoops. This is me here. Came up with some things which were me and things which weren't me. We've got calm, non-aggressive challenger, adaptable, don't need the full details, diplomatic. It's my middle name, diplomatic. Um, and we looked at the things that weren't me to get an understanding of who, of who we were. I don't, don't do the details. I don't dot the I's and cross the T's. This is the things that the other team members are identifying in me as well. I don't like repetitive work. I struggle to ask for help. What? <laughs> um, but what it, what it did for us, the, the thing in terms of understanding each other, what it did is it allowed us to understand what's similar about us, what was working that we could build on. And what became really clear was we're all comfortable with uncertainty. So being an agile consultant, you're going into these organizations and you've got no idea what you're going to find. But it told me with these other two guys in the team, I could send them into these, these gigs without worrying about having to set it up properly, or, or sorry, set it up with all the details. They were happy with the uncertainty. They enjoyed the variety. They enjoyed the fact that we were two days here and two days here and another day here, and then we'll go back to the first organization. And we were comfortable with authority. So again, with your teams, take your disk profiles or Myers-Briggs, whatever personality profiles you, you have, but talk about them together. Which bits of a D are you? Which bits of, of steady are you? Which bits of an influencer are you? And try and get some understanding of why this, how this team might work. Management, again, um, make sure all voices are heard. I do a lot of work with CEOs and execs, and I, I, my conversation with them is always, the hardest thing for you guys is to understand what's going on in your organization, to get, to get the honest truth. So if you are executive or management, hear all voices. Um, facilitate. Don't just let the dominant people talk. How do you talk to the people on the fringes, the, the quiet ones? Or as I put in my notes, um, my original notes, that's what I put. That's what you've got to do. Make sure all voices are heard. So you've, got, you've chosen to be a team. You've got purpose. You've got some agreements in place. You've, under, you've got some understanding. Now we can start to work on honesty. And it's a theme that keeps coming back over the last two days. How do you set up the team so they ask tough questions? How do you, how do you push them into difficult and sometimes uncomfortable conversations? Because it's helpful. We, as Kiwis, we tend to shy away from conflict. We tend to go, ah, that's all right. We'll just put that back in its box and we'll, we'll carry on. Everything's fine. She'll be right, mate. She'll be right. But it's actually productive. It's actually healthy for a team to enter into conflict. Um, we're not looking for a fight. That's important. But when you see conflict, especially in, in something like the Scrum Master role, you need to mine that, and you need to facilitate that conflict to get an, a, an outcome, to get a result. So tough questions. That's what you should be looking for, whether it's in a retrospective, in a sprint review. Retrospective, why didn't we deliver any, everything? What should we have done differently? And often I find teams let themselves off the hook. Oh, yeah, we didn't, 
do that. We didn't deliver because of X, Y, Z, because we were waiting on this. Well, what did you actually do to go and find that? A couple of things in, in, a, in a retrospective. Um, recently, I um, had a, was working with a team, and, and there was some conflict came up. Well, one guy said, oh, so-and-so said this, but don't worry about it, it's fine. And I was looking for the scrum master to facilitate that conflict. And they just kind of let it go. And that's what we tend to do if we don't understand the importance of conflict. Because there's an issue that needs resolving. Another, um, another situation, I was in a, um, I said something in a meeting, as I want to do, I guess I say things. I'm a little bit cheeky. Um, and I said this thing, and, and if someone took exception to it, and it, well, it was more about what I didn't say, and that was the thing which, which um, I couldn't get my head around. We were emailed back and forth about this, com this conflict. We're, so we're in conflict, I recognize that. And we got to a point in the email trail where I just thought it was going to keep spiraling around, so I left it. A week and a half later, I was back in the office. I was, there was an organization in Wellington, and I just took this person aside and said, hey, I just want to circle back on that um, email trail from a week ago. I just want to deal, I was just trying to close the loop on the conflict. I said, look, I like you, I think you're really good. When you give me a hard time about something, I take it seriously. I wasn't trying to explain my position, I wasn't making excuses, I was just trying to close that conflict to know that I hadn't just swept it under the carpet, that I was actually trying to deal with it. So embracing conflict, really important. What have I tried? When we were in this agile team, really simple feedback session, and you can try it yourselves. This is more advanced, I guess, than you don't jump your team into this in the first session. Um, what's one thing you're doing is really good for the team? What's one thing you're doing is holding the team back? You want to get those agreements in place, get an understanding of each other first. But this is a really good exercise to force some conflict in the team. So I did this with my team. You, you go around the group and you ask, you get everybody to answer these two questions about you and then you move on to the next person and the next person. So I can tell you that I don't remember what their answers were for the one thing I do that really helps the team. But I can tell you exactly what they said about the one thing I do that holds the team back. This is individually. They said to me, Joe, you need to hand over more work. I was like, OK. <laughs> I get it. So I went away, 48 hours, thinking, they think I'm shit at my job. You take it personally, but you get over it. If I hadn't asked what I needed to do, and taking on board the same team, what we learned about being comfortable with uncertainty, so I can throw them into these engagements where they don't have all the details, they were really happy with that. But it was really good for me to get that feedback. Did I start handing them work? Damn right. We were doing a lot of this discovery type work, and the mistake I was making was going into a client, doing the discovery, and then handing it over to those guys to say, I've done the discovery. Here's the work you need to do, whereas the enjoyable bit for them was the discovery. So really good. Ask for feedback. Have these sessions. Go around the team and find out what people are doing that's holding the team back. So learning. So we've gone through choosing to be a team. Purpose. This is getting harder every time I do this, by the way. Giving them a purpose. Setting agreements. Getting an understanding of each other. Um, being honest with each other. And then learning. Making sure that you are always improving. And tightening up the review cycle so you, you're always feeding back. So you're learning, trying something, feeding back, how did it work, trying something new. So you're trying to be the best you can be. You're trying to continuously improve. And this is the, the important bit. In a situation with a client at the moment where, um, this is a classic, it's not unusual, UAT testing in an agile environment. Traditionally, it always starts off being outside of the sprint process, and we're trying to pull it in. Us agilists, we're always trying to pull it into the sprint process. And this is my comment. Let's try it and see. And, and if you're a part of a team, if you're um, a team leader, or if you're management, really important concept. We saw it yesterday from, at the keynote with Jake, talking about experimenting and being happy to fail. This sets an expectation that it's not permanent. Let's just try it and see, see what happens. So what do we do? What do we try to, to learn and always get better? After every session, after every training session, we have a small retrospective. This is retrospective from the people who attended the session, but this is our notes about what we want to change. How can we get better? 
It's always looking to improve in here. Um, a bunch of things. Uh, the one that, I, when I had a look at these slides, the one that stands out for me is uh, don't talk through silent brainstorming. <laughs> That's me. That's, I find it really hard not to talk through silent brainstorming. I oh, know, it's in the title, right? But some really good feedback, things to improve on. So you're trying to get better each time. You're not trying to set, up, set yourselves up perfect, perfection every time. You know that you're not going to get there every time. But you're always looking to improve. So you, you start to develop a culture of improvement. And so that, that's six things. Choose to be a team. Have a purpose. Um, set some agreements in place. Understand each other. Have honest conversations and, and learn. But what's really going on is really interesting to me. And it's come through in the last day and a half in this session. At the heart of all of this is trust. Trust. Building trust in a team is, helps to make them responsive. I don't mean the kind of trust where if I leave $10 on my desk at lunchtime, Nick's not going to steal it while I'm away at lunch. That's not the kind of trust. It's deeper than that. It's relying on someone to do the right thing. Relying on the people around you to do the right thing. Because you've got a purpose. Because you've got some agreements. Um, because you understand each other. You understand what's expected of each other. So we, we do this all the time with teams. Um, and it always becomes about trust. We, we tend to, to fi try and fix the symptoms. A lack of commitment. Inattention to results. We try and, we try and fix that stuff because that's the stuff you see. But underneath it all is trust. And without trust... You're not a team. That's the saddest picture I've drawn, I think. That's the saddest looking team. Remind, I think there's a deep purple album cover from the 70s, which looks a little bit like that as well. Um, without trust, it's not a team. You get artificial harmony. How many times do we leave a meeting and go, uh, well, that's never going to happen, but you haven't said that in the meeting, or I think it's wrong because of this. So without trust, you get artificial harmony. You get disappointing progress. And one of the reasons that we want our teams to be responsive is so we can, we can deliver stuff, so we can make progress. With trust, what do you get? You get productivity. People being more productive, you get more innovation. You get individuals in a team are stronger. And trust leads to this thing, which I hear coming back time and time again over the last day and a half, psychological safety. If you haven't read Project Aristotle, go and read it. If you go and read about Project Aristotle. Really important. Because it helps us understand how to make a team. What's important in a team. And psychological safety, I, I kind of sum it up by, by talking about um, willingness to be vulnerable. Willingness to stick your hand up and say, I need help. And knowing that someone's going to be there to help you. In, in terms of my business, I have colleagues Recently, I had a situation where I was, I was putting together some product owner training for the next day. Yes, I should have done it earlier, but you know, you've seen, I don't dot the I's and cross the T's. I'm not a details person. But it was at 10.30 at night. I rang my colleague and said, mate, I've been looking at this for two hours. I'm getting nowhere. Can you help? But I knew he would respond appropriately. Go, yep. And the, the upshot of that, we talked about it, sorted it out, and he turned up to the session the next day and helped me through it. I, could, I was willing to be vulnerable. I stick my hand up and say I'm struggling. But it's also some other areas. Um, willing to challenge and know that, that there's no recriminations, that the challenge is, is, is seen as trying to understand the work. Willing to collaborate. Safety to collaborate. Safety to pull up a chair and go, hey, what's going on? I just want to understand that a bit more. And knowing you're not going to get the old classic developer, yeah, you'll see it when it's finished. Or I'm just working on this stuff. Also, Psychological safety around influence. In terms of, if you're my boss, if I'm reporting to you, I should still be able to challenge what you say and just tr to try and get a shared understanding rather than a shared misunderstanding. And as Kiwis, I think it's something we're really good at. We don't tend to worry about hierarchy too much, or maybe that's just me, I don't know. But psychological safety, really important. So if you get trust, you have psychological safety. How do you get psychological safety? How do you make your team safe? First of all, you choose to be a team. You understand your purpose. We've heard this stuff before, right? We agree on standards and expectations. We understand our differences. We facilitate honesty. We're always learning. All of this stuff that we've just been through also helps with psychological safety. 
and helps to build trust. Circular loop just keeps coming back in on itself. And so the not-so-secret source, what's the uncommon sense or the bleeding obvious? What's common about all of these things? It's you. It's not me. Everyone in this room, whether you're inside a team or outside of a team, everyone here has a role to play in making your teams responsive, building trust in your teams and making them safe by facilitating all the things that we talked about. If you haven't got those, make sure, start talking about it in your team. What's our purpose? We need to have some agreements. I don't understand the process in here. We need to understand it. Um, let's, let's take out our disk profiles and let's talk about them a little bit more. Let's have honest conversations. When you see artificial harmony, call it out. Almost, we can almost go. Do I still feel like an imposter? I've been through all of this stuff. I've tried some stuff. We had some good results. Do I still feel like an imposter? Of course I do. Am I still going to try some stuff? Am I still going to get feedback? Yes, I can. Have I, am I still questioning the secret source or the not-so-secret source? Yes, I am. But I've tried some stuff and seen some results. But I'm going to keep going. And it's what I would I'd suggest you guys do as well. In the meantime, I've got teams who are productive, innovative, and are keeping up with the pace of change. It doesn't happen overnight, but as Rachel Hunter says, it, it will happen. A um, little bit of an old, old joke, I think. Um, I said it to my teenage, son, teenage boys one day, and they just looked at me. Thanks very much. Um, appreciate your time. Um, hang around. I can talk during the break if you like. <laughs>